Okay, this is uh, unit four, and we're going to do cables. Um, this is going to be the inter introduction. Is that cables uh, articles found in chapter three of the NEC have sections titled used, uh, use permitted, and use not permitted. Uh, the sections uh, XXX.10 and XXX.12 give location some specific where the cable systems can or cannot be installed. Uh, also, be aware that the state and local jurisdiction restrict the usage of certain cables in some, if not all, types of occupancy, occupations, occupancy. Talk, we're going to talk about the objectives. After studying this unit, you should be able to know the, that cables must be installed at least uh, one and a quarter inches from the nearest edge of the wood framing members, unless a steel plate or bushing has been installed. You need to understand that non-metallic sheath cable passing through the metal framing must be protected by bushings or grommets covering all metal edges. Now this is a setback for a bore. Uh, holes must be bored to the edge of the hole and it's got to be at least one and a quarter inches from the one end or the other um, from the nearest edge of the wood. Um, the one and a quarter inch setback applies to all locations concealed and exposed. Um, and then um, the one and a quarter inch setback applies to studs, joints, rafters, etc. So it's going through joints, you know, uh, your rafters, uh, or every, that one and a quarter inch applies to that. Now, metal frames. Uh, Non-metallic sheath cable passing through holes or slots in the metal framing must be protected by uh, listed bushings or grommets covering all metal edges and securely fastened in the opening prior uh, to cable installation. What that means is you have to put some sort of met, uh, device in that hole that you punch with that tool down there on uh, option C. Um, and what you need to do is make sure, because cable can sometimes rub against that and short out, which will cause possible fires. Okay, next objectives on this section. Uh, be aware that openings around electrical penetrations through fire resistant rated construction must be sealed using approved methods to maintain the fire resistant rating. You must be able to determine what cables are permitted in spaces used for environmental handling purposes and know the support requirements for MC, AC, and non-metallic shaped cable. Uh, here, what they're talking about here is maintaining a fire resistance rating. It must be fire stopped. And you used, um, there's some caulking that you can use for it if you put a hole in a, in a, in a wood like that that shows in that drawing. And um, um, in hollow spaces, vertical shafts, and ventilation for air handling, ducts, electrical install installations must not substantially increase the possible spread of fire or production of combustion. In other words, what that's saying is if you uh, penetrate an air handling system and then there's a fire that gives <clears throat> a way for that fire to go up to the air handling system and cause more uh, the spread of the fire. Here we have uh, wiring in ducts, plenums, and other ha air handling systems. Um, only wiring methods consist of type M1 cable without without an overall non-metallic covering, type MC cable employing a smooth or corrugated improvised metal sheath without an overall non-metallic covering, um, an electrical building tube, flexible tubing, intermediate metal conduit, or original metal conduit without an overall non-metallic covering shall be installed in ducts specifically fabricated to transport environmental air. Uh, section 300.22 applies to spaces not specifically fabricated for environmentally handled um, air handling purposes. And in the space over a suspended seal and used for environmental and air handling purposes, an example of the type of other space to which 300.22 applies. Okay, be aware of the methods used to secure cables. Understand that cables must be protected from physical damage and be familiar with general 
and specific installation provisions for MC, AC, and non-metallic sheath cable. Here we have um, securing the cables. Securing the cables, uh, generally all cables must be secured to the box or the cabinet, okay? And then the staple cable ties, straps, etc., must be des des designed to secure cables and shall not be installed as to damage the cable, okay? Um, the MC cables must be supported and secured at intervals not exceeding six feet. Um, in the chart there, it shows different types of cables. Um, the metal clad or MC cable is a fully grounded cable. It has a ground conductor with a uh, either green uh, insulation or green and white or yellow. I mean, and armored cable is a that's a the flexible cable also, but it's got a thin uh, non-insulated conductor in there that can short out against or not really short, but it grounds out against the uh, outer sheath, the flexible tube, so everything's grounded. And then non-metallic sheath cable um, is what it implies, okay? So steel plates are used to protect um, where the holes are bored in less than a one and a quarter inch. So you don't have an area where you can uh, get your drill in the center or one and a quarter inches from the one edge of the of the two by four or whatever the stud that you're trying to drill. You need to put a metal plate in there so you can uh, protect the cable from nails and things that could damage the, the uh, conductors if the nail penetrated the cable because it was so close to the edge of the uh, two by four or the stud. Uh, cables installed in a groove covered by wall board paneling and carpeting shall be protected by a quarter inch um, thick steel plate or sleeve. Uh, where there's no potential of weakening building structures, cables or raceways can be laid within notches in the wood. And that's something I would probably do as a last resort because that does tend to hurt, you know, depending on the, the, the whether the joists or something like that. Um, you know, I, I would probably use that as a last resort. And um, requirements for notched wood members apply to all locations. And they're talking about concealed and exposed locations. Okay. Now, parallel to framing, um, what's important here is if a one and a quarter inch setback is not possible, the cable must be protected from penetration by nails or screws by a minimum of one sixteenth thick sheet plate or sleeve if it's possible to get the sleeve on there and is listed and marked steel plate lessens uh, 1 16th of an inch thick that provides equal or better protection against a nail or screw can be installed as per section 300.4 and um, for concealment work in finishing buildings or finished panels or for prefabricated buildings where there's such support is unpredictable um, cables can be finished, fished between access points. In other words, what that's talking about is you just run the cables between your access points. You have a, you have an outlet that's at the, at the level 23, 24 inches from the floor, and you got a switch that's by the door, and you want to run a line down to that box. You can fish the cable up and then back down into that box, and it doesn't since the sheetrock's already on there, you don't have to worry about securing it. Now what we're going to hear is this exposed non-metallic sheath cable in unfinished basements. Okay, what they're talking about here is uh, exposed runs of the type AC cable installed in the underside of joists must be supported and secured at every joist and must be located so that physical damage is avoided. You want to move them to where there's not a door going to open and hit the thing or the cables if you know the doors if it's a low ceiling. You don't want to be near pipes or anything like that. The MC cable must be supported and secured at intervals of six feet. Okay. So Romex type cable needs to be stapled to each joist, but your uh, flexible conduit is what I call it. 
uh, AMC cable or AC cable can be six foot sections, but you use different types of clamps for those. You don't use the staples. Now, uh, let me see here. Go back here a minute. Okay, here we have uh, exposed non metallic sheath cable, smaller than eight gauge wire. Three conductor or six gauge wire of two conductor running at angles with joists in unfinished basements and cross spaces must be either run through board holes in the joists or on running boards underneath the joists. You can see that in the drawing here, you know, which we're talking about the running boards here or the board holes. The nearest outside surface of the installed supported cable must be at least a quarter inch from the nearest edge of the framing. And the three conductors. Uh, eight, can, uh, eight gauge or two conductor, six gauge or larger can be secured directly to the lower edges of the joist. Okay, so that's what they're talking about there. Now, uh, exposed runs of type AC cable installed on the underside of the joist must be supported and secured at every joist and must be located so that physical damage is avoided. Type MC cable must be supported and secured at intervals of six feet. That's not the Romex. The Romex is every joist, and then you, use, you have some U clamps that you use for the MC cable to uh, connect it to the uh, joist. Next, we have understand the conductor's identification and the permissible identification of certain conductors. Have a good grasp of under, ungrounded installation provisions and be introduced to flat conductor, integrated gas, spicer, mineral insulated, and medium voltage cables. Here we're going to talk about general conductor identification. Um, generally, a conductor with a continuous white or gray covering shall be used only as a grounded conductor. Circ Equipment grounding conductors can be bare, covered, or insulated, individually covered or insulated, and equipment grounding conductors must have a continuous outer finish that is either green or green with yellow stripes. Um, conductors used as uh, ungrounded hot con conductors, whether single conductors or in a multicolor Cables must be finished in a way that clearly distinguishes them from un from grounded or grounding conductors. Ungrounded hot conductors, except for a high leg conductor, can be any color other than white, gray, green, or green with the yellow stripes. Now, three phase generally um, conductor identification is generally ungrounded hot conductors can be any color except white, gray, green. Or or green with yellow stripes. A widely accepted practice is to identify the three phase ungrounded hot conductors as black, red, and blue. In a 208/124 Y connected system, and brown and orange, brown, orange, and yellow in a 480/277 volt four wire Y system. Okay. Uh, white conductor is used as an uh, ungrounded switch leg. The white or gray conductor's new use as an ungrounded hot conductor must be permanently re-identified by marking tape, painting, or other effective means. Usually you can have this roll of tape. We use it to you, you even put it on the black conductors on a three-phase circuit. You may have three black wires in there, but there's a there's one that's always a a, a, a black, which is your one you cut, and then you have a red and a green and a blue tape that you bring with you also. And um, red marking tape has been wrapped around the white conductor, redentifying it as an ungrounded hot conductor. Conductor, and you can see that in the in the drawing there. Okay, and understand that you're going to break that tab there. Okay, to because if you look at that drawing, you got a, a white conductor under here, and then you got your black on both of these, so you're splitting it. Okay, so it's not going to feed both outlets. It's only going to feed the top one. Then you have to put another conductor on the bottom one to feed this one. Now, so 
white conductor used as an ungrounded hot conductor. The white or gray conductor can be used as an ungrounded hot conductor if it is part of a cable assembly. The installation must be permanently identified as ungrounded conductor by marking tape, painting, or other effective means. And again, this, this marking tape has to go all the way around the conductor. It cannot just be on one side because you want to make sure it's covered. So it's definitely identified, identifiable. And now flat or uh, conductor cable for installation under carpet squares. This is a... Uh, something that, uh, that's used in, in uh, uh, offices. Now, you, carpet squares are required to cover the floor mounted type FCC cable connection uh, and insulation ends. They shall not be larger than 39.37 inches by 39.37 inches. And um, release type of adhesive must be used. In other words, where you can pull it, the carpet squares up you ever seen them in offices? Um, all FCC system components must be securely anchored to the floor or wall. So you have a box here where your wire is coming in, and then they go underneath this uh, uh, carpet square device, okay? And then you have your box or your outlet. So you could have a cubicle over here or a desk, and you're feeding it through a wall coming off here and that's how you can get them across without tearing up the concrete floors. Um, the FCC cable can be in, installed on hard, sound, smooth, continuous surfaces made of concrete, ceramic, composition, flooring, wood, or similar materials. Most of the time I've seen them installed on concrete because it, it's a lot less expensive to um, use these, these devices than to, you know, chop up the concrete, run your conduit, and then pour new concrete. So this works a lot better. Now, the general installation, you're gonna basically, it's continued setback for board holes. We talked about that, metal framing members, steel plates, parallel to framing members, and furring strips, and maintaining the integrity of fire uh, resistant construction. Okay, here we have, again, setback for board holes. Um, holes must be bored so that the edge of the hole is at least one and a quarter inches. The, um, and these applies to, to, to studs, joint, joists, and rafters. Again, we have the metal framing members. It must have a grommet in them, and it must be an approved bushing or grommet that will cover that so the cable doesn't rub against it and cause uh, the outer sheaths to come uh, compromised. And again, here we have this about the uh, boring. If you use this here, you supposed to put a bit plate in there. Anytime you notch the wood, that's pretty far. This hole has to be uh, one and a quarter inches away from the, from the edge, the closest edge. And if it's not, then you have to put a 16th inch plate in there. And again, you're furring around the material. This this is a this conductor is closer than one and a quarter inches, so a steel plate is necessary. Again, if you run any of these cables and you fish them through a solid wall, this is on new construction. A lot of this is talking about, but if you fish like a piece of Romex or something or flex cable, MC or uh, MA type conduct uh, cabling, then you can uh, you don't have to worry about securing it. Again, the fire resistant capabilities you need to make sure that it's if this is a fire uh, approved uh, installation, it needs to have all holes sealed up like that. Now, if you go through a floor like that and you can't get to it, you know that's uh, pretty much permissible. I would think, but most of the time you wouldn't drill through floors. Now on the top, and I've had to drill through the top two by fours, and if it's a fire rated building, then you would you would be able to get to that hole and uh, put some of that uh, caulking in there to keep the fire from you know 
jumping up through into the roof. And that's what you want to be aware of with that. Okay, wiring in ducts, plenums, and other air handling systems, wiring within the air handling spaces in dwelling units, securing the cables, casting pa uh, cables passing through frame members, framing members. Here we have um, um, our uh, air handling system that's suspended in the ceiling. I've had to deal with these running cable, and usually there's not much room in these type of situations to get your push pole through there to run the cable for Cat5 cable or whatever we were running. And so, but these are usually supported. You don't want to use the supports for the ceiling tile. You have to have these things have to be supported by their own um, supports, okay? And again, um, here we have wiring within the air handling spaces and dwellings. Um, these are what you, you know, the ducts used to transport dust, loose stock, or flammable vapors shall not contain wiring systems of any type. So if you have any um, in these type of conductor systems, it's not good to, to, to do that. No wiring systems of any type shall be installed within a duct or shaft containing only such ducts used for vapor removal or for ventilation of commercial grade cooking equipment. Again, it's, um, you have these air handlers like in chemistry and in labs, like biology, chemistry, uh, you know, a lot of uh, universities have these type of things and also companies. Uh, anything for that type of air handling system, you do not run any cabling through that. You have to run them on the outside or somewhere, you know, where it's not going to be uh, able to be compromised. The cable doesn't get compromised by the fluid, or the the uh, the fumes from whatever they were working on. Section 300.22 does not apply to dwelling unit joists or stud spaces where wiring passes perpendicular to the long dimension of, of such spaces. And we're talking about this right here. Um, so you, you see where the air handling, this is an air handling duct, and here you have a conductor that's coming out that's not, that's not uh, approved. Non-metallic cable ties and other non-metallic cable accessories must be used to secure and support cables. They shall be listed as having low smoke and heat release properties. So if you're going to be dealing with something like that somewhere along the line, your tie wraps and things and cable clamps, which are steel, usually don't have a problem, but you don't want any um, material. I looked at some cable clamps, and there's some that are only rated at 185 degrees. So... Um, you know, you don't want them to put out bad vapors. That's why they do that. Okay. Um, here we're talking about the securing the cables again. We went through this one time already, but it's pretty important. Cables fished through the access points were concealed and in finished buildings or structures were supported as a practical can remain unsupported. And these are stated in sections 320.30D, subsection 1, 330. Dot, um, no, 320.D, no, 320.30D, subsection 1, 330.30D, subsection 1, and 334.30B, subsection 1. So those tell you the where you know what you want to look you could look that up and in in the book now what i've mentioned this in the past is generally all cables must be secured to the box or the cabinet okay if you have a box and you're running cable and it's in a new installation this would be imperative to do um, again that little statement i read earlier is for you know like in a dwelling that's already an office building or somewhere you have to run in a cable to to supply power to some place to add an outlet or something. You run the cable through the wall, it's okay. Um, okay, now the general installation, cables passing through framing members um, running horizontally or diagonally are considered supported and secure when passing through a framing member. Wood, metal, etc. 
uh, unless the supporting intervals exceed those listed specified for that cable. Okay, and here's an instance of not doing what you're supposed to because that's no no. Okay, you have to run it this way or run it back up and then across. Okay. Now, attics without permanent stairs or ladders, we're going to talk about radius bends, attics with permanent stairs or ladders, insulation, anti-short bushings, exposed runs of types AC and MC cables under joists. Attics without permanent stairs or ladders, um, this is the topic we're talking about. Now, attics and roof spaces not accessible by permanent stairs or ladders require protection only within six feet of the nearest edge of the scuttle hole or attic entrance. Now, protection is required for cables located within six feet, uh, measured vertically and horizontally of the attic entrance. Okay. Now, bending radiuses. The AC cable must have a bending radius at least five times the diameter of the cable. This is in section 320.24. Now, the MC cable, interlock type or corrugated sheath, has a bending radius of seven times the exterior diameter of the metallic sheath. And this is in 330.24, section B. Non-metallic sheath cable has a minimum bend bending radius of five times the diameter. And this is in 334.24. And all bends shall be made so that the cable will not be damaged or stressed. Sometimes if you bend them, They'll, they'll be in a stressed mode and, and cause problems later. Now, a curved radius is measured from the inner edge of the bend. And um, now, attics with permanent stairs or ladders, um, cables within seven feet of the floor or floor joists can run through studs, if meeting the requirements of such uh, article. 300.4 section D. Um, cables more than seven feet above the floor or joist, floor joist can run across the face of the framing members. Now, if cables are installed across the facing of rafters or studded and they are located within seven feet of the floor or floor joist in attics or roof spaces that are accessible, the cable must be protected by guarding strips that are at least as high as the cable. And then cables running across the top of the floor joists must be protected by guard strips. Cables installed parallel to the sides of raster studs or floor joists do not require guard strips on running boards. However, the installation must also comply with 300.4 uh, section D. Cables not installed on the face or surface do not require guard strips or running boards. Now, cables installed in attics and roof spaces accessed by permanent stairs or ladders must meet Article 320.23 provisions. Um, there is a note down here, the type MC cable and non-metallic sheath cable must also comply with 320.23. So if you need to look it up to get a better understanding of it, that's where you would look it up. Now, installation and anti-short bushings. Okay, all armor terminated access points of AC cable shall have a fitting to protect the wires from abrasion unless the outlet boxes or fittings are designed to afford equivalent protection. In addition, an insulated bushing or its equivalent protection shall be provided between the conductors and the armor. The type AC cable shall have a flexible metal taped armor and the and the connector or clamp that fastens the type AC cable to the boxes or cabinets must be designed so that the insulation, insulating bushing or equivalent is visible for inspectors. The AC cable shall have an internal bonding strip, copper aluminum, in an intimate contact with the armor for its entire strength. Some insulation anti-short bushings are manufactured so that part of the bushing extends past the conductor or the clamp once installed. 
effectively acting as a flag. This flag increases the visibility of the bushing after the installation. That way the inspectors can see it, that it is, the bushing is installed and it's installed properly. Exposed runs of type um, AC and MC cables under joists. Now exposed runs of type AC cable installed on the underside of the joist must be supported and secured at every joist and must be located so that physical damage is avoided. Type MC cable must be supported and secured at intervals of six feet or less. Okay, so now we're going to talk about exposed non-metallic sheath cable in unfinished basements and crawl spaces. And we're also going to talk about exposed non-metallic sheath cable passing through a floor. Now, exposed non-metallic sheath cable in an unfinished basements and crawl spaces. Now, the exposed non-metallic sheath cable, smaller than 8 gauge, if 3 conductor, or 6 gauge, if 2 conductor, running at angles with joists in unfinished basements and, basements and crawl spaces, must be either run through board holes in the joists or on running boards. That means if you're going diagonally, you need to put running boards in or drill the holes. And I, those holes had to be more than an inch and a quarter from the edge of the joist. Uh, the nearest, okay, I already talked about that. Nearest outside edge of the installed supported cable must be at least one and a quarter inches from the nearest edge of the framing member where the nails or screws are likely to penetrate. Three conductor, eight gauge, or two conductor, six gauge, or larger can be secured directly to the lower edges of the joist. And um, where current carrying conductors and multicolor cables are bonded or stacked longer than 24 inches without maintaining spacing, reduce the allowable amplitude of the conductor as shown in tables 310.15, section B, subsection uh, 3, subsection of 3A. And then it's also shown in 310.15b, section 3, subsection A. Now, you have exposed non-metallic sheath cable passing through a floor. Cables enter an existing conduit or tub tubing used for support or protection against physical damage require fittings uh, on the conductor or tubing ends to prevent cable abrasion. Non-metallic sheath cable passing through a floor must be enclosed in rigid or intermediate metal conduit electrical metallic tubing. Now you can use Schedule 80 PVC conduit uh, type RTRC marked with the sub suffix w, no, XW or other approved means that, that extends at least six inches above the floor. Okay, so there's in that drawing here, it's got to be, you can't just run the Romex right there. Okay, or whatever conductors you need to put it in conduit if it's exposed outside the wall. Okay, raceway or cable openings in the fire resistant floor, rated floor must be fire stopped using approved methods to maintain the fire resistance rating. Again, if you put a hole in that floor and it's a fire resistant rated building, then you need to put the uh, uh, material, the caulking in there to, to seal that up. And I've been some places where there are like uh, a lot of big buildings, you know, large skyscrapers or a lot of the, the newer ones or fire rated buildings. Now we're going to talk about general conductor identification provisions, three phase conductor identification, white conductor used as an un ungrounded switch leg. An ungrounded hot conductor. Okay. Now, normally what we have here is, um, hold on a minute. Okay, a grounded circuit conductor for the control lighting circuit is not required where multiple switch locations um, control the same lighting load, such as, such that the entire floor area of the room or space is visible from the single or combined switch locations. It's like down a hallway or something like that. Switching in three and four way configurations is done only in the ungrounded hot circuit conductor. And then in this installation, the supply is feeding one 
of the three-way switches. Therefore, the grounded circuit conductor is already in each of the switch look in this switch location. And um, you can see, I think I have this in the next drawing here. You can see there where the white conductor, it's the grounding conductor, and then it comes down into this box and they're tied together along with your, your, your other grounding. This is really your neutral. This is your ground. It's the way I look at it. White's usually considered a neutral. Then you have, so you're coming in with your black wires, and then you're coming out with a red and a, and a, uh, a black, okay, which goes down into the next box, okay, and here you have your neutrals uh, tied together along with your grounds, and then your red wire comes in and fills the bottom of the switch. You have one black conductor comes in and goes to the other side of the switch, and then the one leaving the box, which is your supply side, is uh, is uh, at the top of the switch. And then your traveler, which is that red conductor, goes over to the other box. I took it from the wrong direction, but anyway, you get the idea. Um, your supplier is coming into the bottom of the box with the switch, and then you have another switch. Uh, it's a three wire cable because you got the, the red, the white, green, and black in there. Okay, you need that conductor. So that's how you wire it up for two switches controlling one light. Now, uh, grounded conductor provided for the provide for the future. Okay, this cable installation does not meet any of the seven exceptions in 404.2 section C. Although the grounding conductor will not be utilized in this current design, it must still be provided at the switch location unless meeting one of the exemptions in 404.2C, subsection 1 through 7. And this provision for a future grounding conductor is to complete a circuit path for electrical, electronic lighting control devices. That's covered in 404.2, section C. Now we're going to cover for direct cable and cables and conductors Protection of conductors and cables, cable permitted underground, cover for residential branch circuits, and cover for low voltage. We're going to cover all these. Now, we're going to talk about burial cable. Um, you have certain distances that you can bury um, you know, in, and, and bury the cable. that will be under the free, uh, freeze line. Uh, underground cables and conductors installed under a building shall be in a raceway unless the wiring method is type MC or MI and that cable is identified for direct burial and that's in section 300.5 section C. Protection must exceed at least eight feet above finished grade um, coming out of the ground. Okay. Direct burial conductors and cables merged from the ground must be protected by enclosure or raceways, usually in conduit or PVC or some sort of con con uh, protection raceway. Conductors entering a building shall be protected to the point of entry. And protection must extend below grade to a depth matching whatever in table um, 300.5. And... Um, Direct buried conductors, raceways, or cables subject to movement by sediment or frost must be arranged to prevent damage to both the enclosed conductors and the equipment connected to the raceways. Uh, excavation backfill should not contain lard rock, uh, paving materials, cylinders, large or sharp uh, substances of corro or corrosive material where damage to raceways or cables may occur. Um, Normally, what we do is we'll lay some sand or some fine material in the ditch, and then you put the cable in there and put a little bit over top of the cable, and then you start putting the dirt on top. For the conductors or cables emerge as a direct burial wiring method, install a bushing or fitting to protect conductors from abrasion to the end of the conduit or tubing. That terminates underground. A seal incorporating the same protective characteristics can be used in lieu of a bushing.
Now this is the table we're talking about, IGS cable, which is integrated gas spicer cable. It's covered in Article 326. MV, which is medium voltage cable, is in Article 328. Mineral insulated metal sheath cable, designated as MI, is on Article 332. MC, which is metal clad cable, is Section 330. USA Underground Service Entrance Cable, USE, I'm sorry, is three, set Article 338. And UF, which is Underground Feeder and Branch Circuit Cable, is covered in Article 3, 340. Now here we have different kinds of uh, uh, cover for residential branch circuits. Residential branch circuits rated 120 volts or less with grounded fault uh, circuit interrupter, which is a GCFI, GFCI protection and maximum overcoat current protection of 20 amps. Raceways must enclose underground cables and conduits installed under buildings, unless the wiring method is MC or MI. Okay, and uh, those are two different ways for buried cable. You know, you have underground specifications, you have buried cable specifications. And in the drawing over here, it shows you the different methods of securing the cable, making sure it's protected. You know, this one here is like 12, 12 inches of dirt. Here, um, all locations not specified in table 305, which is this one here. And one and two family dwelling driveways and outdoor parking areas used for dwelling permitted purposes it's 12 inches and then this goes along with the different requirements on them now um, cover for low voltage circuits uh, circuits for control of irrigation and landscape lighting limited to not more than 30 volts and installed with the type uf or in other identified cable or raceway which is covered in table 30 300.5 um, these are what your recommendations are for the different depths and normally when I do cable like this I put it in conduit even um, I put in some um, I just a, a fan of putting a conduit in where you can do it it just protects the cable a lot better now we're going to talk about integrated gas spacer is IGS medium voltage which is MV and mineral insulated metal sheath cable now this is um, the integrated gas spicer cable which is type IGS the minimum bending radius is found in the table 22 uh, 326.24 uh, a run of IGS cable between pull boxes or termination not contain more than the equivalent of four quarter bends including those bends located immediately adjacent to the pull box or termination. This is covered in 326.26. Termination of spices must be identified as suitable for maintaining the gas pressure within the conduit. A valve and cap must be provided for each length of cable and conduit for monitoring and maintaining uh, maintenance of gas pressure in the conduit. This is covered in 326.40. Okay. A medium voltage cable, which is type MV. This type MV is a solid dielectric insulated cable, signal or multi-cover uh, conductor rated 2,001 volts or higher. This uh, type MV cable should not be used where exposed to direct sunlight unless identified for use. Now these type MV cables should be installed, terminated, and tested by qualified personnel, usually electric company. Now summary. Now we're going to go. We've gone over the cables must be protected from possible possibility of damage. Conductors must be installed at least uh, one and a quarter inches from the nearest edge of the framing members. Conductors passing through metal studs may require protection in the form of bushings or steel plates. Fire resistant rated construction must remain intact once the electrical system has been installed. In dwellings where wires 
can pass through the short dimension of a joint or stud space being used for environmentally hand, air hand purposes. Um, cables must be secured within a certain distance from boxes unless the cable has been finished between access points. The minimum distance between sorts uh, supports depends on the type of cable and the minimum bending radius must be observed when installing a cable. Unless meeting one of uh, the exemptions in section 400.2, section C, a grounding circuit conductor for the control lighting circuit shall be provided at locations where switch control lighting loads are supplied by a grounded uh, general purpose branch circuit. Certain sizes of non-metallic sheath cable can be attached directly to the underside of exposed joints in unfinished basements. A conductor, a cable assembly white or gray conductor can be used as a switch loop leg in a single pole three-way or four-way switch installation after it has been re-identified. What that means is you mark either put red tape around it or another color besides those three that we talked about earlier. Now, table 300.5 contains minimum cover requirements for ba direct, burial, direct burial cables and conductors. Chapter 3 of the NEC consist, contains provisions for certain specialized cables. Now, that's the end. Now, after you take this, uh, read, after you take and uh, go through this lecture, It'd probably be a good time to go through your quiz. Um, quiz five or four would be what we would need to take next. Um, again, uh, if you have any problems with it, just get a you know send me an email and I'll get it taken care of as soon as possible. Okay. Well, good luck. And have a good day.